Islam came to protect society from criminals and not to protect criminals at the expense of society part 3. The Rights of Society versus the Rights of the Criminal Written by Abu Amina, Abdurrahman Bennett Carry out the legal punishments on relatives and strangers, and do not let the fear of blame stop you from carrying out the command of Allah. Sunid Majah, 320, graded as Hassan by Sheikh Muhammad Nazir ad-Din al-Alban. This order of carrying out the legal punishments refers only to the Muslim authorities and those as whom authority is vested. This does not apply to the hundred renegade outfit ISIS. The story so far. In paper 1, we started our critique of Western attitudes towards Islam's legal punishments by demonstrating a double standard. We argued that even if Islam were on one side of the social spectrum, the harsh side, it would not necessarily prove that Western ideals of human rights and liberal notions of justice have attained the golden mean and have set the desirable standard. The golden mean is the desirable middle, intermediacy, between two extremes, one of excess and the other of deficiency. This is something that Islam commands its adherents to strive for in all spheres of life. The Qun states. Thus, we have appointed you a middle nation, that you may be witnesses against mankind, and that the messenger may be a witness against you. Al-Baqarah 143. Just as I made a direction of prayer for you, I have chosen you to be a good, just and balanced nation from among all the communities. In your beliefs and your ways of worship and in your transactions, so that you will be witnesses for the prophets of Allah on the day of judgment confirming that they delivered the messages Allah instructed them to deliver to their people. And so that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, will also witness that he delivered his message to you. Allah changed the direction of prayer that you used to face, Jerusalem, to demonstrate who was content with Allah's decree, willingly doing as he instructed and following the messenger. And to also demonstrate who turned away from his religion, following his own desires and not obeying Allah's sacred law. The first change of prayer direction was difficult except for those who Allah granted faith to and who were certain that whatever he decrees for his servants has far-reaching wisdom and underlying reasons behind it. Allah will not make you lose your faith in him, or your good actions, including the prayers you pray before the change of prayer direction, Allah is kind and compassionate with people. Not overburdening them, and they will not lose the reward for their actions. Al-Baqarah 143 We then went on to substantiate our assertion with sturdy arguments and compelling evidence. We collaborated on Islam's legal objectives that have come to preserve and protect the necessities of life, demonstrating that Islam places great emphasis on the welfare of humanity. We then went on to discuss how all religions and most ways of life recognize these objectives, but due to the violent rise of secularism in the West, which unconditionally demands a separation of state from religious institutions, the term religion has been gutted of its historical insights and renovated with liberal contents. This required us to spell our religion from an Islamic perspective so that Islam can be judged by its own standards and not by the revised standards that are dictated by liberal notions of religion. We argued that religion in Islam does not refer to the preservation or free flourishing of all religions known to man because, simply put, that would be counterintuitive and counterproductive to the purpose of a true religion or even religion. Secularism looks at religion as one would look at a dinosaur rehe in a museum, a marvel from a bygone time but best kept to those times bygone. We, the Muslims, would accept this as true for all religions but with the sole exception of one. Then we went on to look at the sanctity of life and argued that only within a godly environment can life be truly sanctified. The counter-argument to this would be that even if religion does have a unique outlook on the preservation of life, it also has a unique outlook on ending life for reasons that are inherently religious. The inherent religious component is that all religions see themselves as the true religion and this invariably leads to a bloody game of religious thrones. We would quickly retort to this argument by stating that the term religion has the elasticity to include secular ideologies. The simple definition of religion is a specific fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of persons or sects. What stops this definition from being applied to secular ways of life? Thus, one would argue that the inherent component is not religious but rather it is an inherent part of man and his inability to unite on a common truth which is violently demonstrated through the innumerable schisms that man creates. Moreover, an argument against religion is not necessarily an argument against all religion. The simple fact is that as long man exists, religion, in some shape or form, will always exist. To rid the world of religion would mean to rid the world of man. 
That is not to say that we make life sanctified to the point where it becomes completely inviolable because taking life is sometimes required to protect and preserve the sanctity of life. It is simply an unavoidable evil employed to combat a greater evil. Then we went on to discuss the principle prevention is better than cure and how Western societies are more about the cure than the prevention and how Islam places prevention way before the cure. In this paper, we will take a closer look at the legal punishments in Islam in the context of Islam's five universal necessities that must be preserved and protected for the spiritual and physical well-being of humanity. The be-all and end-all. If you believe that this world is the be-all and end-all then such a belief will invariably have a permanent impact on your view surrounding human life and how life as a human should be lived. If you believe that there is no God or day of resurrection then inevitably this short life becomes the be-all and end-all. If you believe that at some point in your short life that nothingness will embrace you and absorb you, then staving off this oblivion becomes your main priority in life. You will be a true proponent of carpe diem, seize the day, funnily enough. This is not a completely unsalvageable concept in Islam when it's employed to mean seize the day in terms of doing good deeds for the hereafter. And as a result you will place very little trust in tomorrow and even less in the hereafter, about which the Quran says. But, you men, love the present life of this world. And leave alone the hereafter, Ulchiyama, 20-21. Nay, the matter is not as you claimed about the impossibility of resurrection. You know that the one who was able to create you the first time is not unable to bring you back to life after you die. However, the reason for your denial of resurrection is your love for the fleeting life of the world. And your disregard for the life of the afterlife. The path of which is to carry out the acts of obedience that Allah has instructed you to and to leave the unlawful acts that he has prohibited you from. Al-Chiyama, 20-21 so with this all-consuming mindset, what laws would you change in your favor to protect your fragile life at any cost? What attitudes would you adopt towards others who do not share your bleak outlook on life? Would you start to conveniently label those who oppose your outlook on life as barbaric, backward and uncivilized? Despite the fact that for over 1,400 years those who oppose you have been carrying out their civic duties and restoring, and also setting precedents in, human civil rights in states on Wikipedia about married women's property in Britain. Before 1870, any money made by a woman either through a wage, from investment, by gift, or through inheritance automatically became the property of her husband once she was married. Thus, the identity of the wife became legally absorbed into her husband, effectively making them one person under the law. Once a woman became married her property was no longer her own and her husband could choose to dispose of it whenever he thought suitable. This was the sorry state of women's civil rights in Britain prior to 1870. Sheikh Abdullah al jabrin states regarding a wife's property in Islam. The wife owns her wealth and she has the right to dispose of it. She may give it as gifts, give it in charity, pay off her debts, give up her rights to money that she is owed or give up her right to inheritance to whomever she wants, whether relatives or others. Her husband has no right to object if she is mature and of sound mind. Her husband does not have the right to dispose of any of her wealth except with her consent. Fatawa al ma al Muslima, 2674 Translation taken from Kanday Islam Therefore, if you believe that this life is the be-all and end-all then life, or more precisely your life, becomes sanctified to the point of holiness. The justification for this thinking is truly self-serving at its root and conveniently projected through altruistic slogans, such as, the Human Rights Act. Which now serve as the commandments written down by the scribes of liberal and secular law. Because on some level the justification is self-serving, it is also circular because the Human Rights Act was written by humans for humans who place human life above all. Nothing demonstrates this more than the democratic tenet, supreme power is vested in the people. Given that supreme power has been arbitrarily handed down to the people, which human or group of humans have the supreme right to take life. And this is why, ironically, when the matter of taking life arises, we commonly hear the contradictory retort, no one has the right to take life because no one is, God. The Muslims are not required, logically or morally, to believe that, supreme power is vested in the people. Do non-Muslims feel obliged to believe that supreme power is invested in Allah, the sole creator of the heavens and the earth? So must we be held to standards that do not apply to us and are alien to what we wholeheartedly believe in.
Our standards are predicated on a monotheistic theocracy and not on a secular democracy, and until undeniable evidence can be brought to prove that Islam is inherently false. We do not see why we should be judged by the makeshift standards of others. Islam sees democracy and every other schism invented by man as inherently misguided and Islam is not shy to share what it sees. And neither was the prolific English writer H. G. Wells who said, every religion that is not suited to civilization should be rejected. I have not found any religion that is suited to civilization except Islam. Milestones in human history. The Qun states. This then is Allah, your true Lord, and what is there after the truth but error, how are you then turned back? Eunice 32. The one who does all of that O people is Allah, the truth, your creator and the manager of your affairs. Then besides truth, what is there except error and loss? How do you turn away from the clear truth, with its proofs, to fossid whims and desires? Eunice 32. The wisdoms behind legal punishments in Islam. At this point in our two-part paper, it should be clear that Islam's objective is to protect and preserve, 1, religion, 2, life, 3, intellect, 4, lineage and, 5, wealth. However, these five dash universal necessities, which are aimed at maximizing human welfare, cannot be effectively protected and preserved unless we have legal-based punishments in place to a. deter those who have little or no regard for these human necessities and to b. protect the masses from those who have proven they have little or no regard for these necessities that guarantee human welfare. The key words in the previous sentence are deter and protect when you look at the matter from a socio-ethical perspective. However, Islam has a third way of looking at the wisdom of legal-based punishments that can only be observed through the lens of religion. Like most religions, Islam teaches the concept of sin which involves the act of transgression against God and his laws. Islam teaches that every human will be resurrected and judged by God for the way he chose to live his life, and based on his beliefs and deeds. He will dwell for an eternity in either paradise or hell. The Qun states. Mankind's reckoning draws near while they turn away in heedlessness, al anbiya 1. People's being taken to account for their actions on the day of judgment has come close, but they are turning away from the afterlife in their unmindfulness. Due to their being preoccupied with the world. al anbiya 1. It also states in the Qur'an about this day, which the multitudes are heedless about. On the day when every person will be confronted with all the good he has done and all the evil he has done. He will wish that there were a great distance between him and his evil. Al Imran 30. On the day of resurrection, every person will find the good that he did in front of him, without any deficiency. Those who did bad will wish that there was a great distance between them and their bad actions, but shall a desire will be worthless. Allah warns you of himself, so do not become the subject of his anger by committing sins. Allah is kind to his servants and therefore gives them this warning. Al Imran 30. This is the day that the overwhelming majority of humans have believed in, either through scripture, intuition, or a yearning for a justice that is meted out objectively without being undermined by human shortcomings. Islam teaches us that one of the ways a Muslim sins and punishment in the hereafter can be reduced or even erased, Fadl ibn Sal said. There is a blessing in calamity that the wise man should not ignore, for it erases sins, gives one the opportunity to attain the reward for patience, dispels negligence. Reminds one of blessings at the time of health calls one to repent and encourages one to give charity. Is by a person undergoing some harm or hardship in this world. The said Prophet Muhammad. Nothing befalls a believer, a prick of a thorn or more than that, but Allah will raise him one degree in status thereby, or erase a bad deed. Sahih Muslim, 4560. These words from the Prophet of Allah only carry weight with those who truly believe in Allah and his messenger, and for this reason. The Prophet characterized the properties of a believer in the following hadith. Strange are the affairs of a believer, for indeed all of his affairs are good. However, this is not the case with anyone else except in the case of a believer. If prosperity reaches him, he is thankful to Allah, and thus there is a good for him in it. And if some adversity befalls him and he endures it patiently then there is good for him in it. Sahih Muslim, 127. This state of being and state of thinking is truly something reserved for a believer. 
How can anyone who denies Allah or sees nothing beyond this world cultivate for himself an outlook like this? The Muslim and the non-Muslim share one existence but they are light years apart in terms of how they view and understand their shared existence. The Muslim is taught to view his punishment in this world as a purification process that absolves him of his burden of sin before he meets his Creator. This faith-based outlook towards punishment is not an attitude common among non-Muslims and as a result, non-Muslims struggle to see and appreciate such things from a Muslim's perspective. During the early stages of Islam, the Prophet, S, took an oath of allegiance from some of his companions. In this oath, they swore not to associate anything in worship with Allah, steal, commit illegal sexual intercourse, kill their children. Not to falsely accuse the innocent or disobey the Prophet with regard to anything good. Then the Prophet went on to say the following. Whoever among you fulfills his pledge, then his reward is with Allah. And whoever falls into any one of these, sins, and receives the, legal, punishment in this world, that punishment will be an expiation for that sin. And if one indulges in any of them and Allah conceals his sin, it is up to him to forgive or punish him, in the hereafter. Sahih al-Bukhari, 2.11 The great scholar of Islam, Ash-Shafi'i, said regarding this hadith. I have not heard anything that provides greater indication of how the legal punishments serve as an expiation for its people than this hadith. Hardship and adversity that we experience in this world can come to a Muslim's rescue in the hereafter. The Prophet said, on the day of resurrection, when people who had suffered affliction are given their reward. Those who were healthy will wish their skins had been cut to pieces with scissors when they were in this world. Jaini Atumidi, 2402 So now we can factor in a third wisdom for the wisdoms behind legal punishments in Islam. a. To deter those who have little or no regard for the five human necessities and b. To protect the masses from those who have proven they have little or no regard for these necessities that guarantee human welfare and, c, they serve as a means of expiation for those who commit major sins. So these are just some of the wisdoms behind legal punishments in Islam, and this is why the Muslims believe that. Carrying out one of the legal punishments prescribed by Allah is better than if it were to reign for forty nights in the land of Allah, the mighty and majestic. Sheikh al-Albani graded this hadith as Hassan in Sahih al-Jami 1139.